Good morning, uh, dear participant, and welcome to this course. Uh, this module titled Women's Employment, Distant Work, and Gender Responsive Social Protection uh, is a module um, developed by UN Women under the collaboration with EDEP. I will be uh, your presenter for this course. My name is Dr. Muriel Amitoglu. I'm the regional feminist economist within UN Women Western Central Africa Regional Office. The objective of this course is to strengthen your capacity in the area of gender responsive social protection and also to discuss the gender inequality with respect to the labor market. We'll talk about uh, the concept of uh, women accessing the labor market, what are the constraints, what are the gender gaps that they face, what are some policy recommendations that countries can put in place to reduce this gap, those gaps. At the end of this course, uh, we hope that you will be able to understand the basic concept related to women participation in the labor market and also in the decent work. Uh, we hope that you'll have understood how to advocate for gender responsive social protection measures and policies to ensure full participation of women in the labor market with access to care services. The, this module is structured in two parts. The first one talks about um, employment, decent work and gender. We will review um, key notions of gender gaps in employment. We'll talk about the significant gains that for women to access in the labor market and the barriers that they face. We'll also uh, talk about some effective policies to address those gender inequalities. In the second part, we'll have the focus on gender responsive social protection. We'll explain the definition of social protection. We'll explain the gender inequalities that women face in response of a, response of social protection. We will also talk about the new notion, what we call the gender responsive social protection, what it is, what are its key components. And we'll also um, review some policy priorities to extend uh, social protection coverage for women. Okay, let's start with the first part. So, uh, some data on gender inequality around the world. Uh, women in developing countries uh, works more than men with less access um, to education, leisure, political and economic participation and self-care. This is because uh, in most countries and especially in Africa, women do not only paid work, but also on paid care work, taking care of children, taking care of families, fetching wood, water. So on political participation, we'll see that only 26% of all national parliamentarian and 22% of government ministers were women in 2021. And approximately half of world countries never had a female head of state. Adding to that, women face violence. Um, some data uh, show that 85% of women and girls aged uh, between 15 and 49 have experienced physical or sexual violence by an intimate partner in their lifetime. We also have an estimated of 246 million girls and boys that experience school-related violence every year. And what is the cost of violence for the economy? So violence and harassment has a negative impact on workers, on enterprises, and the economy. And this costing uh, around 12 trillion um, every year to the global economy. Due to financial costs related to absenteeism, turnover, litigation, and compensation, in their risk code from reduced productivity. On the literacy and education attainment, we also see that uh, one third of women are illiterate compared to 17.6% of, of men. So these uh, data really show the gap um, and inequality around the world. 
Now let's talk about some gaps in the economic participation. Um, in Africa, uh, we have women face a low labor force um, participation rate. We have fewer women entering the labor market compared to men. Uh, for the data, we have 62.7% of women in the sub-Saharan region that participate in the labor force compared to 72.6% for men. Women in our region face a high level of informality. That they, they have informal jobs um, that mostly don't have so social protection benefits. 95% of women in the West and Central Africa region, for example, are in the informal employment compared to 88% of men. Women entrepreneurs or women-owned businesses face a huge financing gap. There is um, uh, estimated around 8.6 and 8.9% of the GDP in the provision of social protection benefits. Like I said earlier, women do most of the unpaid care. On average in Africa, women spend four times more than men attended to unpaid care and domestic work. And the COVID-19 crisis had a significant impact of women compared to men. Uh, it is estimated that this year, 244 million of women and girls will be living in extreme poverty uh, due to the pandemic. Now let's have a look at the gender gap. Uh, so for this, there are several indexes to measure a gender gap. Here we'll use the global gender gap in this framework. And when we talk about gender gap, gender gap is the difference in any area between women and men in terms of level of participation, access to resources, rights, power, influences, remuneration, and benefits. <clears throat> the global gender gap in this framework um, is composed of uh, several sub-indexes. You have economic participation and opportunity. Here we're talking about women accessing opportunities to develop their market, opportunities to have jobs. There's also education attainment. We talk about women, access to education, high school level, um, university level, um, all necessary capacity building, access to health and survivor, what are the health services in the country, and then political em empowerment. How many women have access uh, to the parliament, how many women advocates and voices are heard in a country. So uh, for this year, the index shows that we are at 68.1% of parity in the world, which means that um, it will take around 132 years to reach the gender parity in the world. When you talk about the Sub-Saharan Africa, it will take around 98 years to close the gender gap. But uh, there are disparities within the region. We have countries that have a better score, uh, which are Rwanda, Namibia, South Africa, Burundi, and Mozambique. And then we have countries that are performing uh, quite low, like Comoros, Benin, Mali, Chad, and DRC. Sorry. Uh, now we talk about employment and decent work. What is employment? So the official definition by the ILO, uh, employment are people um, that are wor of working age, of course, who during a short reference period are engaged in any activity to produce goods or produce services for pay or for profit. So what is decent work? Decent work involves opportunity for work that is productive 
and delivers a fair income, security in the workplace and social protection for families, better prospect for personal development and social integration. <clears throat> freedom for people to express their concern, organize themselves and participate in the decisions that affect their lives, and equality of opportunity and treatment for all women and men. So here is uh, a simple uh, definition of decent work. So to have a decent work, that means that there is quality employment opportunity for, for um, the worker. There are fair wages to remunerate the work. The worker has a secure employment through con contract. There are um, reasonable working hours. Work-life balance so that the worker can have time to attend to family and personal life. Equal opportunity and equal treatment in work meaning um, no discrimination. The worker needs to work in a safe environment, free of violence and harassment safety standards. The worker has to benefit from social protection. And there is an opportunity to have a social dialogue between employers and workers' representation. So when we have all that, it's decent work. Uh, now we'll talk about measure of gender inequalities in the labor market. Uh, so uh, there are several indicators to uh, identify inequalities in the labor market. Uh, we'll talk about the gender labor force participation gap, uh, the gender employment gap, gender pay gap, horizontal and vert vertical segregation in the market, and also gender gap in the decent work. Let's start by women participation in the labor force. So from we can see from the graph, this is the labor force participation rates um, in West and Central Africa region for 2019. If you see, for example, um, in most countries, the, the trend is like uh, women participate less in the labor market. In some countries, for example, from Congo, we can see that we have the same uh, level of participation for both women and men. In countries such as um, Guinea for the period, we have even female participation that was higher than male. In Niger, there is a huge gap between male participation and female participation. In Sierra Leone, for example, we also have a slight uh, higher participation for women compared to men. Men, but on average, for for this region, we can see that women participate less in the labor market, and this is due to several structural factors affecting this. With unpaid care work being one of the key factors that can explain this, and we will explore more the issue of unpaid care in the next module. Now we'll talk about gender-based occupational segregation. Women face several constraints, including unconscious biases, social norms, lack of exposure to and information on sectors, and time and capital constraint that hold them back from entering male-dominated sector. So when we talk about gender-based occupational segregation, is the fact that men and women are typically concentrated in different occupation and economic sectors. There are two types of gender-based seg occupational segregation. What we call horizontal segregation and vertical segregation. Let's dig deeper. Talking about horizontal segregation, we have um, differences in the industrial distribution. That means that globally, women are concentrated in the service sector, employing more women compared to agriculture or industry. For example, um, in 
2015, more than half of employed women were in the service. And this is compared to just one fourth that were engaged in the agriculture. While men are mostly concentrated in the industry sector. We can also see the differences in the occupational distribution where women are highly represented in clerical services and cell occupation sector, um, mainly um, occupation where when they attend to services and there they outnumber men. We also see them in elementary occupation, which is mostly associated to part-time employment and low paying jobs. When we talk about vertical segregation, um, that means that what are the differences within the same industry? So uh, we see female share of employment in managerial or decision processes are lower. Typically, women have a low or very low representation in management, leadership, and decision-making position within companies. This is the case even for industrial jobs with female uh, domination, such as health or education. We can see for the graph that um, for the Sub-Saharan Africa, women in 2015 um, have 29.3% of women are have a managerial position. This increase in 2020 by uh, up to 29.8%. But this is still low compared to other countries such as Latin America and the Caribbean or Europe and Northern America. So we see that for our region, women are still underrepresented in managerial position. Now, uh, let's talk about the gender wage and earning gap. So um, here we put uh, the formula to calculate the wage, uh, wage gap, gender wage gap. So the gender wage gap is um, the difference between men average wage and women's average wage divided by the men average wage times 100%, which will give you uh, the raw gender gap. So there are differences uh, in sources. So depending on the source, earnings sometimes include income from self-employment, but mostly activities undertaken in the informal sectors are not included in salary surveys or administrative data used to measure the gender wage gap, which is critical because women are highly represented in those informal activities and the gender wage gap really doesn't show it. So let's see some numbers globally around the world, women are paid about 20% less than men on average. The gap between men and women's expected lifetime earning globally. So the expected lifetime earning is the earning that an individual is expected to earn throughout its life cycle. So the, the gap between men and women uh, through the lifetime is around $172 trillion, which is nearly two times the world annual GDP. This is really huge. And from the World Bank data, we see that only 95 economies around the world legally mandate equal remuneration for work on equal value in line with international standards. There's still much to do here. In the Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, gender pay gap is 28% in informal employment, where majority of women work, compared to 6% in formal workers.
when we have a quick look at the employment gender gap. So we see that the employment gender gap, females, women, face more employment level compared to men. And this is the general trend. Even if in some countries we have male unemployment rate, which is higher. In the sub-Saharan region, there is a correlation between GDP per capita and female labor force participation. So um, here we have the Africa is comprised of the oil exporter, mainly uh, fragile state, low income countries, middle income countries. And we see the rest of the world is the gray area. So um, female labor force participation varies with income per capita. So he, what we see here is a U-shaped relationship. That means that when the income per capita is low, we have more women participating in the workforce because they need to work in order to escape poverty. They need to work in absence of better social protection programs. But once their income increases or once the household income increases and there are more opportunity for social protection, women can withdraw from the market in order to take care of their household, take care of their children. That explains that U-shaped relationship that we see. And this U-shaped relationship has been found to be stable over time and hold even controlling from country characteristics. So let's take a look at the gender gap in youth unemployment. Uh, so here is the share of youth, not in education, employment, or training for 2019 from um, selected country in the region. And from what we can see, there are larger gender gap in youth unemployment in Africa with more young girls than young men, not in education, not employed or not in training. And this could be due to early childbirth, marriage, unpaid care work, and this, of course, contributes and will contribute to create gender labor force participation gaps, gender gaps in wages and earning in the future. Now let's talk about informality. So in the previous slide, I've said that women are engaged in more uh, activities in the informal sector. Let's look at the data. So here we have uh, the level of informality from different regions around the world. And we can see that informality in Africa is very high. And it also is almost 76%. And this high level of informality will contribute to the identified gender gaps in the labor market. So digging deeper, we have here a graph which look at the decent work and informality. So we have from the for the African continent the green shows um, the share of women in informal employment compared to the share of men in the informal employment. So we can see that for uh, the African continent, from countries, especially in the sub-Saharan region, 
the share of women in formal employment exceeds the share of men in informal employment and is up to 90% in sub-Saharan Africa, which means that more women in the sub-Saharan African region have access to less decent work, which means high exposure to work deficit, low social protection benefits. If you want to dig deeper and um, find out statistical data to measure gender gap for your country or for a region, you have time use surveys um, available. There are also labor force surveys uh, that are conducted within countries but you need to check out for the frequency and the quality. There are also um, ILO um, online statistic database that has a lot of collection of information on work, labor, and gender. There's, you can also check the World Bank uh, gender statistic. There's also more information in the World Bank uh, annual women business and law publication. We also have the OECD social index and gender index and UN Women, Women Count uh, website that provides several statistics. So we talk about the gender gaps, the gender inequality, but why do we need to address this issue? Potential market gains from closing gender gaps in economic participation. So. Uh, this graph shows the losses due to gender gaps in economic participation in selected countries. So we see uh, from, for example, from Niger, almost 23% of GDP is lost every year due to gender gaps in, econ in economic participation. If the country manage to close the gender gap, it will gain this 23% of GDP, which is huge. And we see high level for several countries in the sub-Saharan African region. We also have several examples where we need to close the gender gap and aim for gender equality. Gender equality, will help the a global economy gain an estimated 160 trillion US dollars if women were earning the same as men in the workplace. So equal pay, equal hours, and equal participation in the workforce could lead to a global wealth jump of 23,000 and 620 US dollars per person globally on per capita basis. The risk for not taking action on gender inequality or gender equality will cause an average loss of 15% in OECD countries, 40% of which is due to entrepreneurship gaps. Having equal uh, economic participation for women and men could create a knock-on benefits, such as lowering malnutrition, malnutrition and child mortality rates. Investing in women entrepreneurship is essential for economic growth. Women-run enterprises have significant contribution to poverty reduction and is estimated to contribute to close 3 trillion US dollars to the economy in the United States, creating up to 23 million jobs. Now let's talk about um, unpaid care work. So there are huge gender inequalities when it comes to the time spend on unpaid care work in every part of the world. 
So we can see from each region, women spend more time taking care of housework, taking care of their kids, taking care of the family compared to men. When you look at the data for um, Africa, unpaid care work is blue, in blue. So women spend 263 minutes per day doing unpaid care work compared to 78 minutes for men. And they have less time to do paid work, estimated at 154 minutes compared to 251 minutes for men. And it's not a surprise to say that unpaid care domestic work takes away time for paid work. And we see a negative correlation between proportion of unpaid care work per day and economic participation and opportunity. So when women spend more time doing domestic work and unpaid care work, they have less time to go to the labor market, less time for entrepreneurship, and that reduces their economic participation and opportunity to do so. Um, we take a quick look at the gender youth inequalities and we see a high level of uh, inequalities within youth, especially in Africa. Um, around 60%, which means that in the future, there will be a higher gender gap for those women and men, which are now young men and young women, if nothing is done. So one can ask, what are the structural causes of gender inequality in the labor market? We have several causes. So here we put um, just the key categories. And it's your job to think of the causes specific to your country, specific to your region. And if you don't see here in the table, you can add them. So um, they are first labor market structure. When we talk about labor market structure, uh, we talk about um, issues constraining women access to the labor market. Why are they not entering the labor market? So like we said, um, they spend too much time devoted to unpaid care. They are less flexible or hybrid working condition for women. There is a high level of informal employment. And there are, in some countries, lack of quality and affordable childcare for women to take their kids in order to have more time uh, for work. We also have institutional constraint, of uh, which can be the absence of limited um, policies, reforms, addressing the labor market and gender equality in the country. Low provision or legal rights for maternity or paternity leave. The issue of sexual harassment that women face at the workplace. The third area is opportunity. So women have limited education, limited opportunity uh, to education. Either when you talk about the quantity of education means um, the time or the years that women spend on education or the quality of education. There's also less opportunity in health services, financial access. In most uh, countries in the sub-Saharan Africa, we also have limited access to safe transportation for women. Lack of knowledge of opportunities exist in the labor market. They don't have the information or they have asymmetric information. 
And we also have differences in rural and urban environment with women living in rural areas having less opportunities. Coupled to that, we have the social norms. So social norms, um, they could be um, early marriage or uh, female uh, genital mutilation practices in some areas. School dropout um, due to cultural norms when women are not allowed to go to school up to a certain age. They are within household, gender division of housework where women or young girls are expected to be doing uh, the housework when um, men or young boys are not. And of course, all the issue of unpaid care. So now let's talk about some policies to reduce this gender gap in labor participation. So the first policy is to have a work-life balance. So here are some suggestions. Uh, so the, the first is to reduce and redistribute the burden of unpaid care work. You will see um, much detail on unpaid care work and these strategies in the next module. The second suggestion would be to provide universal access to high quality and affordable care services for women so that they could be able um, to take their kids to um, child care centers, child care services, um, high um, health centers when their kids or family members are sick to have more time. This also need to guarantee decent work hours and flexible work hours to women, to mothers, to provide maternity leave, paternity leave, parental and care leave with equal opportunity and incentive for men and women, and also to provide um, insurance schemes. The last one is to harmonize work hours with hours of service or of care services. We see some countries even have uh, created care centers within the companies when women can leave their kids and attend to work. Some concrete examples of life, uh, work and life balance policies. Um, in Zambia, a female employee is in entitled to 14 weeks of maternity and fathers up to 10 days of parental leave. Um, in Kenya, uh, we have uh, the law that makes provision for three months of full paid maternity leave and paid leave for two weeks. In Philippines, uh, maternity leave was increased up to 105 days. And uh, in Turkey, provision have been introduced to allow uh, women to work from home or outside the office. And parents can ask for part-time uh, work until their children reach a compulsory school age. In Mauritius, um, workers can request from their employers the right to work from home, either on full basis or split between home office, client place of, uh, of business. The second set of policy will talk about promoting equality labor market policies, reforms and institution. Here, that means to have equal pay of work of equal value in the legislation and practices. Secure the right to organize uh, workers in collective action. Prevent all form of gender violence and sexual harassment within the workplace. And we have some countries, such as Sao Tome and Principe, uh, Togo that have um, ratified this kind of legislation. You have, we need policies and legislation to ensure gender equality in education and health. For example, in Zambia, 
the, the law allows young mothers to return to school. And uh, we need to put appropriate laws in place, but also to make sure that those laws are really uh, applicable. Here is a case study um, in the Women, Business and Law Report of this year. We have some countries uh, that apply recent reform targeting women access to labor market. In Benin, um, there was a removal or restriction of women employment in construction. So now women can work in industrial jobs in the same way as men. In Senegal, uh, there is a prohibition of gender discrimination in employment. Burundi mandated equal remuneration for work of equal value. And Angola enacted uh, legislation protecting women from sexual harassment in employment. It also adopted criminal penalties for sexual harassment. The second case study will look at Sao Tome and Principe. So in 2009, uh, the country introduced domestic violence law. And years later, it implemented a workplace sexual harassment law with uh, criminal penalties. In 2014, there was an equalization of both the age of which men and women are entitled to full pension benefits and mandatory retirement ages. And we can see that all these measures have increased uh, female labor force participation in the country. So there is a positive correlation between law changes and female labor force participation. The third set of policy is uh, what we call active labor market policy. So, um, here we could have um, to extend the coverage of active labor market policy to include the non-participant working age population, promote gender equality in employment services, ensure women access to training, skill, reskilling, upskilling, including incentive to entry, into and training in non-traditional fields. Adopt public work scheme to include labor intensive social infrastructure schemes. And uh, an example will be Uganda. So uh, Uganda help workers access different labor markets overcoming sectoral and special mismatches. So here, uh, when we talk about sectoral mismatches, it arises when people are trapped in the wrong occupation as trade or technology changes the demand of labor. Uh, so um, in a study, it shows that Uganda women who cross over into male-dominated industry makes three times as much as women who remain in female-dominated industry. And in Uganda, 6% of women operate in male-dominated sector, where 34% of men have businesses in those areas. So this can be linked to uh, the discussion that we had on horizontal and vertical segregation in the labor market. So addressing this segregation can increase women participation and also increase women uh, wages. The last set of policies will be to tackle unequal gender norms. We need to change the behavior, the conception, the thinking of the community. So we see women are reluctant to earn more than their household and adjust labor supply. And we've seen that from some uh, study conducted. 
And the study uh, shows that even women that earn more tend to do more housework. Studies also shows that women are reluctant to speak in university classes because they believe that they will not come across as marriageable. Even in top position, women held to male standards. For example, female political candidates ex are expected to be married and with children, and most often unmarried women are penalized. So uh, here are some um, examples from advanced countries, especially from the US. And in the sub-Saharan region, we have the gender norms are mainly conception from the family, conception from uh, the community of what women or young women are expected to do. So here closes the first part of uh, our module. So just a recap, in this first part, we talk about the issue of employment, decent work and gender. We gave basic concept. We show that there are significant gain for women accessing the labor market. And uh, we propose some effective policies to address these gender inequalities. And uh, we also um, give some statistics for you to go and check the gender gap in your country or in your region, in your zone. Now we'll talk about the issue of gender response and social protection. In the second part, we'll cover the concept of social protection we look at the gender inequality in social protection. We will then introduce the concept of gender responsive social protection. We will uh, take a look at the COVID-19 crisis and um, the measures that country introduce, especially social protection measures with respect to gender. We will talk about the need of having gender responsive social protection to build um, economic growth, to build economic development and resilience of an economy. And some policy priorities to extend the coverage for women. Let's start. What is social protection? So. Social protection can be defined as a set of policies and programs aimed at preventing and protecting all people against poverty, vulnerability, and social exclusion throughout their life cycle. So the life, life cycle, we'll come back to it, is from the childhood until the adulthood, until the person dies. So social protection can, includes benefit for children and family, maternity, unemployment, employment injury, sickness, old age, disability, survival benefits, as well as health protection. Social protection measures are mostly gender blind because they rarely use gender disaggregated lens for understanding the exposure to risk and vulnerability. But at the same time, they, don't, they are not gender neutral because since they are poorly designed, because they don't account for women and young girls' needs, they don't account for um, their um, constraints, their vulnerabilities, those social protection tend to exacerbate or contribute to gender inequality. We have different types of social protection. We have three main types. You have the non-contributory, the contributory, and what we call labor market policies and intervention. Non-contributory, that means that the person receiving 
the social protection benefit does not pay for it. That is the case for social assistance or social care. So social assistance that could be in form of social transfer, where, for example, the government will transfer money to a certain groups of population. It could be cash transfer, voucher, in-kind transfer, for example, including school feeding, including uh, soap, food for um, a certain groups of the population. It can also be public works program when uh, what we call cash for work, when you have uh, someone working instead of cash, working instead of food. It could be fee waivers on basic but uh, services such as healthcare or education. It could be government giving subsidies for fuel or subsidy for food. We also have what we call social care. So social care, that will be uh, the government providing uh, family support services or home-based care or care infrastructures, actually, that um, the individual or household can benefit from. That could be, for example, uh, the government setting up a child, a child care center service. Aside non-contributory, we have contributory social protection. That means that the person receiving it contributes, pays. Here we have what we call social insurance. So social insurance, you have health insurance or insurance for unemployment, maternity, paternity, disability, work, accident, and so on. For the contributory, they can, it can be paid by the worker or mostly by a certain percentage is paid by the worker and the employer. So you have different schemes. We also have what we call labor market policy or intervention. So labor market policy intervention, that set of policies, reforms that government have put in place to accompany or to have, um, to create an enabling environment for better social protection in the country. So for that, we have active labor market, which is work sharing, providing training, upskilling, reskilling training for workers. Uh, having job search services for people to receive the information and uh, apply to jobs, receive the information for opportunity existing. And we have what we call passive labor market policies, which are mainly uh, reforms to have to provide better benefits for employees, maternity benefits, paternity benefits, Injury compensation benefits uh, that the legislation uh, will um, settle. You also have a change in legislation, for example, having minimum wage in a country to define safe working condition uh, and so on. Here we look at a gender gap in legal coverage, some data for uh, Africa. So uh, the graph shows the proportion of women and men with comprehensive social protection legal coverage. We see that uh, around the world, women, which is in gray, uh, enjoy 26.5% 26 of women enjoy comprehensive social protection defined uh, by the legal coverage compared to 34.3% for men, which are in blue. And this is even lower in the sub-Saharan African region and also in the Northern region. So in Africa, only we have 3.9% of women compared to 10.8% of men. When we look at the gender gaps in benefits, are here in pension for selected countries. So for selected countries around the world, looking at in Africa, we have here Zambia. So uh, in Zambia, we have 34.7% average of 
women pension. That means that in Zambia, women benefit from only 24% of the same benefits regarding to pension that women receive, which is really low. If we see in countries, for example, Australia, women receive almost the same 99.9% of benefit that the men receive. It shows that there's still much to be done in countries such as Zambia and countries in our region. When we look at non-contributory pension schemes, um, for the past years, countries have um, included several schemes to close gender gaps in pension or gender gaps in, uh, in other uh, non-contributory um, social protection. And for example, we have universal social pension that was introduced in Kenya, Mauritius, Namibia, and Zanzibar. But however, there are differences in the adequacy of this pension because um, they are not sufficient enough to bring older women above the poverty line. For example, in Namibia, uh, the pension is at $78 per month, which is above the poverty line, which is good. In Kenya, it's $20 per month, which is below the poverty line. In Zanzibar, it's $9 per month, which is well below the country poverty line. So we can see that the issue is not only having a pension coverage, but to make sure that the benefits really helps women um, to move from extreme poverty. Now we look at social protection in the Sustainable Development Goals. So in the Sustainable Development Goals, the main goal related to uh, social protection is the goal one, target 1.3, which says that countries should implement appropriate social protection schemes and measures for all, including social protection floors. And by 2023, uh, by 2030 achieves substantial coverage of poor and vulnerable. Aside, we have several targets related to social protection in the other SDGs. For example, in the SDG 3 related to health, you have the target 3.8, which say that countries should achieve universal health coverage, including financial risk protection access to quality, essential healthcare services, access to safe and effective and affordable essential medicine and vaccine for all. In the SDD 5 related to gender equality and target 5.4, there is a need to recognize value on paid care and domestic work through the provision of public services, infrastructure, social protection policies, and the promotion of shared responsibilities within a household and a family as nationally appropriate. The SDD 8 related to economic growth in its target 8.5 uh, aimed to achieve full and productive employment and decent work for all women and men, including young people and persons with disabilities and have equal pay for work of equal value. The SDD 10 related to reducing inequalities in, in its target 10.4, urge to adopt policies, especially fiscal, wage, and social protection policy, and progressively achieve greater equality. So we see that in the Sustainable Development Goal, social protection is a key issue. Now, let's talk about why gender matters for social protection. Like we've seen, women are overrepresented among those who like social protection. 
they have fewer social protection coverage compared to men. And even when they are covered, they often receive inferior social protection benefit from men. And there are gender specific life course risk and vulnerability that women carry throughout their lives that need to be addressed. And we'll talk about that shortly. So when we talk about life called risk, there's through childhood, youth, adulthood, until old age. So um, in childhood and youth, women face barriers to education and school work transition. They are often subject to child or early marriage in some areas. They face teenage pregnancies. When they migrate to adulthood and working age, they face issues related to maternity health risk, maternity income risk, single motherhood risk. And towards their old age, women are subject to widowhood risk and widowhood court practices in some countries and old income old age income risk women have a, a higher life expectancy compared to men and when um they are the adult root when they are widow there is a significant reduction in the household income in some areas and adding to all those life call risks that women carry throughout their life cycle, they are also compounded by what we call structural inequalities. So structural inequalities are unequal access to jobs and resources. Second, gender-based violence. And third, the issue of unpaid care and domestic work. So we need social protection policies that can address all this risk and the structural inequalities for women to benefit. Let's take a quick look. So uh, a gender lens review of national social protection strategies in Africa. Uh, here we have um, listed the type of risk, life cause risk that we mentioned. And here we have the number, number of national social protection strategy that recognize each category of risk. And um, we can see that most risk, most national social strategy address maternal related risk, especially maternal health risk. Here uh, in um, blue, you have the global for all Africa. In gray, you have West and Central Africa. In light blue, you have East, Eastern and Southern Africa. So for the whole Africa, we see most countries in their national strategy mainly address maternity related health risk. We also have a uh, single motherhood maternity related income risk and barrier to education and training. But we have less country addressing the issue of old age risk and also the issue of child early marriages and providing social protection strategy to address them. So how to address uh, gender-specific life come risk? Here are some examples. On adulthood and youth, in Bangladesh and Mexico, government are providing higher cash transfer for, women, for girls, children, especially in regions where they face disadvantaged education. For working age, um, we could expand coverage of maternity protection and access to childcare services 
for example, um, a librarian Rwanda. There could be cash transfer linked to credit and training programs, for example, being implemented in uh, Ghana. We can also support uh, for feminized sectors such as domestic workers, agricultural workers. For risk related to old age, there could be universal or pension tested social protection, which should be non contributory. Care credit in contributory schemes, there are uh, in application in Argentina, Bolivia, and some Latin America countries. We can also develop a long-term care service system, for example, in Capo Verde. When we talk about structural inequalities, here we look also at the 30 national social protection strategy in Sub-Saharan Africa dividing in Western, Central, and Eastern and Southern. And uh, we can see, for example, when we take unpaid care, we have eight national strategies that recognize it in the Western and Central Africa, but only six have special measures. In the Eastern and Southern region, you have seven that recognize the risk, but only four measures to address it. For violence against women, we have eight, 12 countries that mainstream in their social protection strategy, but only four countries have specific measures. in the Western Central Africa. When we talk about, for example, lex access over uh, resources, in the Eastern and Southern Africa, you have 14 countries that recognize the, this inequality, but only six have special, specific measures. So here we see that even though there are some forms of formal recognition and measure, to redress structural inequality, there are limited action from the government. So uh, let's take a case study of Cabo Verde and his national care plan for the implementation of a national care system. So uh, Cabo Verde um, implements a care plan uh, which comprises childcare and long-term care with the objective um, to provide training for caregivers, to create a national care service network, and to promote policies that encourage domestic redistribution of care tasks. There were specific actions including capacity for family caregivers, creation of municipal network of daycare centers with a view of achieving universal coverage, expanding the current network of rehabilitation services and day center for older person and person with disabilities. And the result, um, despite government effort to put the national care into practice, including municipalities and other stakeholders, there are numerous obstacles remaining to achieve universal coverage for other people and people with disabilities. But this is a good example of a system that covers a mix of child care, loan care service, covers the issue of unpaid care work, the issue of work for care workers. So, we're talking about the need to have a gender responsive social protection. So why should we mainstream gender in social protection? It will help alleviate overall poverty and inequality, which will help build economic, social, and political stability. This is related to the SGD 16. 
gender responsive social protection will reduce gender gaps, which is related to SDD 10 through narrowing down gender gaps in poverty rate, enhancing women access to income and asset employment and financial services. It also offer protection from gender based violence and abuse. Such gender responsive social protection will promote economic growth and support response to shocks, for example, the COVID-19 shocks, which related to STD-8 economic growth. And this can be done through increasing consumption on aggregate demand, because when women have better social protection benefits, uh, they, they are eager to in, they enter the labor market and they will consume more based on the wage that they will receive. They will build women's resilience to shocks, where are climate shocks, economic shocks, external macroeconomic shocks. The COVID-19 crisis um, revealed the vulnerability of women without social protection benefits um, to face the crisis. Gender responsive social protection will also promote productive, decent employment and entrepreneurship for women, girls, and youth. This will be done through facilitating access to better jobs in the job market and reduce women informality. It can also improve access to quality health and education services, which related to SDD3 on health and SDD4 on education. Uh, through better access to food, better nutrition, higher access and utilization of health services, higher education and or technical capacity. And um, lastly, it will foster social changes regarding gender rules such as unpaid care and domestic care, which are related to SDD5 through increasing gender responsive availability of care services in the country for women. So having a gender responsive social protection allows country to achieve an inclusive, sustainable, gender sensitive development. So policymakers in Africa have committed to the 2015 Addis Ababa Declaration and the Sustainable Development Goals, but also African Union Agenda 2063 on the Africa we want. And those uh, declarations have included social protection. And the COVID-19 pandemic has added further momentum to have a regional or national social protection agenda. Talking about the COVID-19 response, we countries have implemented several measures to address the COVID-19 pandemic. And we see here we have number of social protection measures announced during the crisis. So the pandemic has created the need and the urgency to have social protection measures to mitigate the impact. But we can see that the measure adopted were mostly gender blind. So here we see globally 196 countries out of 226 countries that adopted have adopted at least one gender sensitive measure. And when we look closer at the measure related to social protection, only 12% target women economic security 
and only 7% supported unpaid care work, which is really low. So most social protection measures during the COVID-19 pandemic, mostly gender blind. But now look at some good examples, some gender sensitive measures during the pandemic that were that mainstream gender. So the first one is Togo. So uh, the Republic of Togo leveraged digital tool to explain social protection to urban informal workers during the pandemic. So the government introduced the NoVC program, which is a digital unconditional cash transfer scheme in April 2020. The beneficiaries are citizens uh, over 18 who have a voter ID and informal workers who have been affected by the pandemic. So women receive higher amount than men since they uh, account for the significant gender inequality in the country. So women receive around $21 compared to $18 for men. And the result, the program was extended uh, the program extended protection to uncovered population while simultaneously building social protection capacity. So in total, we have more than 800,000 beneficiaries, among which 63% were women. And there is evidence of positive impact of poverty and equality in the country. Another good example was the support that South Africa uh, gave to childcare providers during the country. So prior to the pandemic, um, South Africa had a cash transfer program that it harnessed through grants which supported 6 million informal workers in the first iteration. So they receive uh, $21 per month, equivalent to 28% of the national poverty line. They also have introduced a child support grant with a caregiver allowance for six months. The result of the initiative revealed that there was an increase in women applicants 66% of new applications were re received were for women. And at the same time, the grant el income eligibility threshold was slashed by 60%, reducing its overall coverage. Now, how can we build back better? not only from the COVID-19 pandemic, but build back towards having better social, gender responsive social protection schemes. So first, we need to redefine the, the notion of social protection. It's not money that countries are giving out. It's productive investment, investment on youth, investment of women, investment in persons with disabilities, investment for future generation. We need to create solutions for the missing middle, especially informal women workers. Extend social protection to uh, people with disabilities or to other groups, like for, for example, migrants that are often overlooked. We need to have a greater attention to care needs, health care, child care, long-term care, to see the differences and to address them accordingly. That could be through social assistance, social insurance, labor market programs, providing care services, 
We also need to create sustainable and adaptive systems for the long term. That means to have a financial and administrative capacity, including data to monitor, to evaluate the schemes, to include women association while designing those kind of schemes, women beneficiaries, and to make the link between the climate urgency and the issue of social protection in the long term. But one question will be, how can countries have money to finance gender responsive social protection? So we need to talk about fiscal space. So fiscal space is defined as the resources available as a result of active exploration and utilization of all possible revenue sources for a government. Put simply, is the resource available for a country through diverse sources, which domestic, international, private, public, in order to pursue a policy or reform. So there are eight financial options that all countries should consider while trying to create or expand their fiscal space for gender responsive social protection. So in summary, we put the eight here. The first is reallocating public expenditure. This could be done through, for example, reducing expenditure for defense and allocating to social protection areas such as health care services. It could be uh, through gender responsive budgeting to really put a gender lens in the budget expenditure of the country. The second is to increase tax revenue. So increased tax revenue could be done through increasing the tax rate or bringing more people into the formal economy. For example, giving incentive for women working in the informal sector to be in the formal sector that will increase the tax base. Third is the eliminating illicit financial flows. In several countries, there are trillions each year that are escaped for, from the formal uh, financial flows that countries can recoup either through a better expenditure uh, strategy or through reforms and policies. Fourth is to expand social security coverage and contributory revenues. The idea here is to have more people contributing to the scheme either employees or employers or mix. The five is to tap into fiscal and foreign exchange reserve. Um, here are some countries, for example, have put uh, in place um, sovereign fund that could go on the market in order to borrow money or into dri to drive uh, um, the, 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 the money, the private uh, resources available within the country and to finance social protection activities with that. The sixth will be managing the debt, especially in most uh, African countries where you have a higher level of debt. That will be through uh, borrowing um, the market or restructuring the debt. We also need to have an adopting to adopt an accommodative macroeconomic framework, which means that while designing macroeconomic policy, we need to put social protection to put the issue of gender responsive policy at the beginning of the concept. They will allow to have an accommodative uh, macroeconomic framework, which should be sustainable for the long run. The aid will be lobbying for aid and transfer. Uh, here that could be um, the ODA or assistance from uh, donors. Also captain uh, uh, savings for migrants, uh, remittances from uh, a migrants or the, the diaspora to invest in social protection uh, schemes in the country. 
So our uh, here there is this uh, graph shows that we can accommodate spending on social protection. Here are social safety net public expenditure in Africa. Uh, in three categories, we have oil exporters, resource intens intensive country, and non-resource intensive country. So we see a wide uh, hegemony in social spending among African countries. And which is, what is surprising is that when you see from example, um, Lesotho and Mauritius, they are non-resource intensive country, but yet they spend more on um, safety net and social protection compared to resource intensive countries such as uh, Namibia or even oil exporters such as Angola or Nigeria and so on. So here, countries that have opportunity uh, through uh, oil exports or resource intensive export can default or allocate more to social protection. So here, uh, we can have a gradual approach, which means that, like we said, we can expand existing social protection uh, measures by allocating more beneficiaries or vertically by improving benefits level or frequency. A gender responsive social protection should combine contributory and non-contributory instruments in order to accelerate progress toward universal coverage, which is the goal. Um, the gradual approach should take into consideration the fiscal space available to countries. So here, like uh, there, we talk about the eight types to increase fiscal space. So for example, in Cambodia, Costa Rica, and Mauritius, then even Sri Lanka have reallocated resources from defense and security to improve social protection systems. Now we'll talk about a uh, universal social protection flow, which is the main goal. Um, so providing universal social protection floors means to have quality and accessible healthcare, including maternal care, have basic income security for children, including access to nutrition and education, especially uh, pre-primary education, basic income security for working age people to earn sufficient income uh, to be able uh, uh, to face resilience in case of sickness, unemployment, maternity, or disability risk, and to have basic minimum income security for the elderly. And uh, UN women uh, have created some gender equality principle for designing uh, social protection floors. So here we need women rights to income security and access to basic social services. Comprehensive approach is needed to social policy that combine universal access to services through contributory and non-contributory, like, like we said. Delivery of universal quality social services need to be considered as a component of a gender egalitarian social protection floor. While defining their strategies, countries should conduct thorough, assess thorough assessment of the needs of the caregivers and care receivers, focusing uh, on the needs of women and uh, uh, youth. There's a need need to narrow forest household by targeting more through affordable uh, short-term schemes. But there's also the need to think on the long-term. Need to introduce, um, to introduce such universal system, countries first need to increase or to expand their existing fiscal space. 
social protection floor should take into consideration universal child allowances, public work programs, and having pension reforms can effectively support gender equality for older women and widows. Now let's talk about the way forward. How can country make sure that they have a gender responsive social protection and build resilience through shocks such as the COVID-19 shocks? So the first one we talk about it is financing. They need to invest in universal gender responsive social protection system through expanding their fiscal space. The second is to build global, national, local food system by working in partnership with those who sustain them. There is a need to have reliable, good quality data. That should be says disaggregated that could help monitor and evaluate the strategies or the reforms of the policy that are being implemented in order to provide security for women's livelihood. And lastly, there needs to be accountability on the strategies that are being implemented. So for that, we need to ensure that voices of all workers, either in the formal in the, or in the informal sector, um, are heard in order to shape the economic recovery. So here are further reading in case you want to broaden uh, your knowledge on um, social protection, but also on uh, gender gaps on employment. So we put here some policy briefs and some reports are, are really um, important and insightful that you can download easily online. So thank you for this participation in this course. And uh, this course uh, was brought together by the collaboration between UN, UN, UN Women and the EDEP. And uh, we hope that uh, this course have helped you to increase your knowledge on gender gaps that women face in the labor market and also in the notion of gender responsive um, social protection. This is all for this module and uh, we hope to see you soon. Thank you.